We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the last day of the IGF 2021 and to one more amazing session from the NIR's uh, collaborative sessions. This uh, session is about digital sovereignty and digital self-determination. Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, some colleagues here uh, on site and also uh, our colleagues uh, online. I can see there are many uh, is still coming in. Um, and the, the session today was organized, of course, by the NIR uh, network, and uh, it's really tackling on this underlining question since the beginning of the digital times, which is how to accommodate uh, this network of networks without the boundaries uh, with the state laws that are, have the territorial um, underpin uh, in it. Uh, but also tackling some of the, the, the changes in the geopolitical scenario uh, where you have some models uh, surfacing uh, from the US, uh, from the Chinese, and uh, perhaps the Europe in the middle, uh, making suggestions on how to accommodate regulation and uh, the rights of sovereignty countries uh, with the digital society. And so, uh, without further ado, uh, we do have uh, a great uh, roster of speakers uh, today that are going to bring this local level uh, discussions uh, through the NIRs. The session today is structured into three main parts. Uh, the first one I'm going to call uh, for the next 20 minutes, nine um, uh, I, local IGF organizers uh, to give their pitch uh, talks, uh, their tweet talks about what has been uh, surfacing in their local IGFs. Uh, then we are open up for 20, 25 minutes uh, of interaction and uh, debate and, and uh, with uh, the, the audience online and on site. And then uh, we are going to uh, wrap it up for 10 minutes at the end, uh, bringing it all together and having the final remarks from, uh, from the speakers. Uh, so let me start by uh, putting some, um, some uh, questions uh, for, for the speakers. I'm going to call first uh, Pedro Lana from the Youth IGF. He's on site just here. Um, and uh, Pedro, I'm going to put one. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to put the two questions. You feel free to to tackle them. Uh, first is the risks of digital autonomy balancing national interests with preserving a global internet. What are the concrete cases from the NIR's community and from the youth uh, like IGF uh, in terms of infrastructure connectivity and fragmentation? Are there specific uses in terms of internet development and safeguards for citizens' rights, uh, for example, cooperation among countries? Pedro, please. I'm actually going to uh, answer that instead of a specific case on a more general note, that the interesting part about the youth, uh, like IGF, relating to digital, digital sovereignty is that youth and the LAC region usually have a uh, similar way to be treated um, about the sovereignty in general, that others try to do it for us. So uh, in this, in this uh, place, when we are talking about uh, digital sovereignty, we have to know that uh, the same concept that the same concepts that apply to uh, United States, that apply to Europe, can be, and uh, normally they are not the same things that will apply to us as youth in uh, Latin America. For example, data sovereignty may be something here in Europe, in the new directives, and it may be something really, uh, totally different when a deputy from Brazil is proposing it. 
Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. And uh, I think uh, self-determination is the key uh, remark uh, that we need to take into consideration. Um, next, I have online uh, Aileen Sejas. Aileen, uh, bienvenida. Aileen is going to talk about the youth, uh, the perspectives of the youth IGF Argentina. Aileen, you can take the floor. Thank you very much, Raquel. I'm having issues to start my video. Let me just ask that, uh, the technical support, if you can um, allow Aileen to open up her video. Yes, yes, okay. They are working on that, Aileen. Yes, awesome. we're here. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me the floor, Raquel. Uh, I can give you um, a little bit of the perspective from the youth in Argentina. Um, well, in Argentina, we have the president of the draft bill about digital sovereignty on data from 2017, when the reason behind this law was to protect the data of the Argentinian state by keeping all the data in national servers without the possibility of making security backups in foreigners' jurisdiction. I think this law could have been relevant if we have a, an appropriate cybersecurity strategy and national revenue, and let me tell you why. Uh, the recent disclosure of the Argentinian database of IDs, RENAPER in Spanish, uh, compromise deeply the security of personal data of citizens. Uh, that is not something to take lightly into consideration, uh, besides the seriousness of a security breach of a national database. Going into the general picture, uh, we believe the idea of having national data in national servers is a good thing, but we shouldn't forget that Argentina still doesn't have the capacity on its own to have those servers, not only because of the necessity of more funding in building the internet infrastructure networks and providing digital tools to marginalized communities from both private and state contributions, but also because first we need to think about implementing a strong cybersecurity strategy with the participation of all stakeholders in its designs Besides asking, of course, for the support on other neighbor countries to gather best practice, practices, because we believe we should maintain an open internet approach. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Eileen. And um, I take your key points on uh, how to balance uh, the data localization and the open internet and what are the, the threats uh, in, in the middle. Um, and then uh, next, uh, I'm going to call uh, Carlos Afonso for the IGF uh, Brazil. I don't see Carlos. Sea, are you online? Perhaps if he has not been able to join yet, I can... Um, Call the next speaker, and then we go back uh, to to Sea later. Um, so next is uh, Saliano Funi from uh, Côte d'Ivoire, IGF. Saliano, or Saliu? Sorry if I'm not pronouncing correctly. <laughs> Are you online with us? I cannot see everyone right now. So let me call, um, I, I will keep uh, Carlos and, and, and Salu for, uh, for the last, um, uh, um, for the, the, the bottom of the list. And then I call uh, Mr. Ponsele Ileligi. I'm so sorry if, if I'm not pronouncing it correctly yeah, from yeah. the IGF Gambia. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I'm Raquel, um, very good. Um, for me, um, in looking at this particular um, discussion, we have to take into account that it indirectly focuses on the new in initiative on digital cooperation, um, the roadmap on digital cooperation. All the eight key action points are really linked to this. And we have to take a human-centric approach in dealing with this. That is, it has to be bottom top. And 
when I mean bottom top, it's not just coming down to the grassroots and saying, okay, um, for the sake of it, bottom top, but the bottom up, top approach is making use of our youth as catalysts to achieve this. Because overall, we are having a very younger population. In Africa, by the time we even talk of um, getting into the end of the um, sustainable development goals, you discover that our population, over 60% of the African population, for example, which is about one point something billion now, will be under the age of 35. So um, having that young, vibrant population, which are eager to do things, we have to realize the importance of this topic. And um, that is where I will stop for now before going further ado. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Poncele, and a very good point, I think. Uh... Of course, uh, Pedro also <laughs> agrees and, and has mentioned uh, the, the power of the youth and, and how it's important to give them also autonomy and, this, and respect the self-determination. Um, so next I have uh, from IGF South Sudan, uh, Kennedy Bolin and uh, Adok Guy. I believe they are online. Could you... Open the mic and take the floor. I don't see they are online too. So we might be having some issues to, uh, with the online participants. And let me see the next one is also an online participant, Dustin Loop. Dustin, are you online with us? Can you open up the mic? Okay, so uh, let me call another um, participant from the IGF Netherlands, Stephanie Tewin. I think uh, not here, okay. So let me call um, one that I saw was online. And so <laughs> Peter Koch from IGF Germany. Peter, are you yes. with us? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you, Raquel. Um, I cannot share my video, but. Uh, let me just ask here um, one second. No, it, it, no, it now works. You can. Thank, okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, so. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. And um, uh, let me uh, let me re reflect a bit on what we've um, been discussing. Um, so on our in in our uh, meeting in in September, actually we had a couple of um, action points that that kind of re, um, relate to the questions here. Um, first, I should probably say that um, when it comes to cooperation across countries, being a um, being in a in an EU member state. Um, there is in, in most all the, the legislation and the cooperation, there's cross country cooperation built in, in a way. Um, but that nece doesn't necessarily make things easier. It, it also means that we usually have a multi stage legislation proce process, things that are decided at the European level, um, and then go directly into force in the, in the member states or go to the national legislator for implementation and or refinement. And uh, the most prominent um, topics on the table for this are currently the NIS2, the um, Network Information Security uh, Directive and the Digital Services Act that regulates intermediaries and, and platforms um, uh, most prominently. Um, that, that just as an example. So, We've been discussing di uh, digital sovereignty from uh, two angles, I would say. One is uh, the, the enabling part. So uh, we had an example of open source in the administration to actually enable um, the, the national administrative entities to um, go back to a software repository and cooperate um, to reduce the dependencies of, say, external suppliers 
um, and and help each other to um, uh, to deal with or to 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 serve the citizens um, and and cooperate on a more technical operational level. And the other prominent example that probably has been a couple of participants here have heard of is this um, European initiative called Gaia X when it comes to a uh, cloud service that is um, user friendly that uh, is supposed to support um, the GDPR and uh, the, the national or say continental um, sovereignty in a way. And maybe that is um, enough for the introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I like uh, the, the structure also on this um, uh, reducing and, and, and trying to balance, right? Uh, how to reduce the dependence with the foreign um, um, uh, and external suppliers, and uh, but also uh, keeping up with the technology. So I cannot see more of the, the participants that were listed. And I'm so sorry if I'm skipping anyone, you can jump in at any time. But I think it's important that we start now the discussions and the debate. I see lots of people um, online. We do have our participants on site. Um, and I would like to open up for some, uh, for some further comments. Uh, if you have from your um, national and, and regional initiatives, if this topic has surfaced and how it's going, um, it's being tackled. Is there any considerations? Please feel free to put in the chat also if you want to speak about it. Um, we are restricting the, the video sharing. Um, just to avoid uh, Zoom bombing, but... Um... Hello, can I? Yes, of course, can Mary, please go something? ahead. <laughs> okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining. Um, uh, this topic is um, of interest to us in Africa. Uh, um, Ponslet has already painted the picture of our young people, the population of young people in Africa, vibrant, and uh, they are also unemployed. And, and we think that um, in Africa, when we did a school, uh, school on internet governance with uh, Frida, uh, the, this topic came up strongly that uh, we need uh, data sovereignty. Uh, not only that uh, we need it uh, for, for uh, political reasons or economic reasons, uh, no, more of economic reason because we want our people, our children to be employed or our young people to be employed. So we need to develop, you know, host our, our, our data within our continent. And in that, in that process, we'll create employment for our young people. And they will also help them to develop local content. And um, also that, um, the uh, that data collection is within the African continent. Uh, that strongly uh, people raise those issues during the uh, uh, School on Internet Governance. And also the fact that there's also the fact, the, the truth of the security issues that are involved as well, that our, our data um, could be vulnerable uh, anywhere if we, if we don't develop our own sovereignty in terms of hosting our data. Uh, so there are security issues, there are economic issues, and also there are social issues. And uh, uh, that's the intervention I'll give for now. And uh, I can intervene again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I think you spark one of the key points that, which are how to make this uh, data sovereignty. I mean, uh, Peter has the experience from the GDPR, which is precisely to bring this data closer to the user, to empower the user, uh, but also to have all the other surrounding uh, and the enabling environment that surrounds it, right? So it's about the infrastructure, it's about the social economical impact uh, that needs to be in place, uh, but also about the resources that needs to be in place, because uh, once you, you, you bring that uh, back, 
uh, you need to have uh, the, the proper uh, infrastructure, but also the skills for the local content development. So thank you very much uh, for, for sparkling this part of the discussion. Um, and I have Nadja Tishana, who would like to bring uh, some of the, the perspectives from the youth dig. Uh, Nadja, you can take the floor and I'm going to ask that technical support uh, if you want to open up your video. Good morning. Hello, this is Nadia Czechia. I'm based here in Bruges in Belgium. I am um, now a co-host, so I can share my video, but I just briefly wanted to um, tell you a little bit about the youth messages from uh, that came out of Euridic. So every, uh, every year, the European Dialogue on Internet Governance has a youth program that happens right before, and young people come together to design youth messages to present issues that are happening in their local communities that they wanted to raise to European um, stakeholders, but also to the wider communities. And one of the issues that they wrote, added to the agenda was digital self-determination and how incredibly important it is and their concerns about it. So um, I have now, um, well, I'm trying to add that to a chat. I'm, I'm seemingly have a little bit of problem with, uh, with Zoom this morning, but um, the, for them, they had a really interesting discussion about digital self-determination and what it would mean and how the future is going to look like in regards to this. They talk a little bit about um, uh, bias and discriminatory views against specific countries and having um, a sense of that we need to protect the openness of what the internet needs to be. Uh, and um, they want to look at different types of tools that uh, private and public bodies could use uh, and as well, digital literacy as a way to provide a confident approach for digital self-determination. So I hope um, that this will give you a little bit of insight about what youth are doing here and the kind of thoughts that youth are doing. And these were also brought into the Euridic process itself. Uh, they had a session on digital self-determination. Um, sorry, we talked about digital self-determination. They talked about digital sovereignty and some of the issues and points uh, were then discussed with um, with uh, actors and, and policy makers. So this is something um, that we are very keen on um, supporting further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nacha, for also uh, bringing us to this, um, uh, to the difference also uh, that is so important about digital sovereignty and digital self-determination. They are, of course, intertwined, but uh, it, it's also important to bring this difference forward. Um, and uh, I, I see the, the link uh, uh, that you sent with the, the youth uh, erodic messages. So thank you very much in the chat. Um, I'm looking if there is uh, there are any other comments uh, and welcoming our Dhaka Bangladesh hub uh, to the session. Uh, we are now opening up the discussions. If anyone else wants to make a comment, otherwise I will bring some uh, teaser questions perhaps for, uh, for our speakers. Okay, so uh, Dhaka Bangladesh, uh, you wanna take the floor? I'm going to ask just uh, our technical support to open up your video. Hello, I'm in my audio, hello. We can hear you at Dhaka Bangladesh. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. Still we can't open our video. Just one second. Can I ask technical support to open up the video for um, Remote Hub Dhaka Bangladesh? Oh, it's now on. You can open up. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, audible and videoable also. Hello. Hello. Uh, we Hello. Are <laughs> We are so glad to be a part of this IGF 2021 Poland. It's a very great opportunity for Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum and the Remote Hub. Uh, thank you so much, uh, IGF. Um, one of us now uh, 
share our uh, statement uh, to the IG. Bolan, Bolan. Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, you've lost your video. If you can turn your camera on again. And we are okay. glad to hear your, your statement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, it's okay. Uh, we will share our statement few minutes later. Uh, one of us is uh, confused. Please pardon us. Okay, no worries. I have uh, the the in the queue. Uh, Osvaldo, Osvaldo, uh, hola, buen dia. Hello. Osvaldo. You can take the floor. I think we are having some connectivity issues, perhaps. Um, Osvaldo, I will keep you in the, the, in the queue. Um, and I'm going to call next uh, Iki Chan Chin. I'm so sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly. Would you like to take the floor? And then we go back to Osvaldo and uh, the Dhaka Bangladesh hub. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, <clears throat> my is just a question. It's not a, uh, so yeah, I have a question actually for 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 the host or the organizer of this for uh, this panel. Actually, I, I'm just wondering because um, we we had a, a previous discussion about uh, digital sovereignty. Uh, in many other platforms, even among the academias, I think there's a general agreement. Uh, in many uh, areas uh, between the Europe uh, approach and uh, the Chinese approach, which is about the sovereignty, you know, there is uh, sovereignty and the sovereignty can apply, the concept of national sovereignty can apply to cyberspace. But the major difference is the distinction is between the European, China and the American approach. So basically uh, it's the American who has the other opinion, a stronger opinion, uh, which she, against the application of the national sovereignty to cyberspace. So therefore my question is, uh, because I haven't heard uh, any speaker from the in, uh, national or regional internet governance talk about their position. So I wonder, is there any voice from America can share their view with us? Thank you very much, uh, Iki Chin. Uh, we are waiting to have also our IGF USA uh, connected uh, as soon as it, they are. Perhaps they could share um, more on, on, on the inputs uh, from, from their local discussions. But uh, um, I, I would also open up uh, after we go through all the questions, uh, if anyone in the room or uh, any of the speakers wanted to tackle because I think it's important. Um, I have uh, <laughs> Milton Miller here who wants to 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 take the question. Uh, I'm just going to try uh, Milton if you allow me before you reply to uh, Ikichin uh, question to see if we can hear from Osvaldo and then the the Dakar Bangladesh sorry <laughs> hub Osvaldo. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, I will just say, I, I'll be brief. I, just to say that in the implementation of internet exchange points, it's a kind of local network that uh, strengths uh, sovereignty, no? But uh, the fragmentation of networks, as uh, is the case of the different countries that are implementing this kind of of infrastructure of blockage is not so good for internet because uh, the nature of of this infrastructure is especially to interconnect uh, in a global uh, in a global sphere uh, creating inclusion for everyone and each country has their own 
own contents, their own language, their own cultural behaviors that are represented in the network. And um, uh, giving us the opportunity not only to, to share our, our uh, local values, but to share the global uh, culture is part of this network that is intended to, to promote knowledge, to promote uh, best practices and uh, fragmenting it in a way that we cannot access or get out of, of the premises of our countries uh, limits the possibilities of the, this digital divide that we all are trying to, to implement. Another thing is that infrastructure, best practices, uh, standards are in a technical infrastructure, are above, are uh, down uh, in the bottom just to support the interconnection between all of us. So uh, when pol politics, uh, geopolitics are uh, mixed in the technical infrastructure, uh, they create a confusion that uh, most of the time uh, create a weakness in between all of us. So uh, implementing uh, internet exchange points is a way of creating some kind of sovereignty or sovereignty because we all create local contents and attract uh, international uh, content providers uh, to strengthen uh, the interconnection. So that approach we are working on uh, from Internet Society in Dominican Republic to strengthen and to interconnect, but not to separate or fragment the network. I think other countries must uh, consider uh, their positions in order to create bridges, not separate among of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. Muchísimas gracias. Um, for your intervention. Uh, and Osvaldo speaks from uh, Dominican Republic. And so uh, thank you very much uh, also for raising another layer uh, that is so important in this discussion, which is the geopolitics and uh, the, the, the infrastructure, right? How, uh, when they are um, uh, embedded uh, <laughs> in one into another and what is the, the, the threats in this approach. Um, I'm just going quickly to see if uh, the, our Dhaka Bangladesh hub is um, is ready to make the statement. Otherwise, yeah. we can. Yes, you are. You okay, question. go ahead. Uh, uh, as uh, the question is, uh, as we know, many of uh, local government impose data protection low expert and social media users. However, fear that it will be less about protection and more about intervention into user data. Uh, what about the opinion on this statement? Thank you very much, uh, Dhaka Bangladesh. Uh, we do have then the question on um, local government imposing data protection social media to social media users uh, yeah. and, and, okay and the fear that it will be less about production and more about intervention into user data exactly. i take this question to the speakers uh i will convene uh, but we so going back to the the question from iki chin um oh i see mary has the hands up uh can i go to milton and then I open up the, the, for, for uh, the, the replies. Milton, if you want to tackle uh, Iki Chin uh, question about uh, the US approach and how this is, um, uh, let's say, accommodating or not with the Chinese and the European perspectives. Well, thank you, uh, Raquel, for the ability to intervene here. Um, and I appreciated the, the comments uh, from the, Umberto, was it? Yes, um, talking how you can have local diversity and so on without uh, building borders and walls around your internet economy. 
So I think uh, it's one reason I came into this session is because I see that it is isn't continuing to propagate this confusion uh, between digital sovereignty and self-determination. So, uh, and this is something we addressed in our own uh, session on uh, Wednesday on digital sovereignty. We just tried to shoot that down completely. So sovereignty is a collective characteristic of a, a collective entity, the state, and it refers to their supreme authority. And fundamentally sovereignty is about building walls or borders between your authority and other states' authority. And individual self-determination in a digital sphere is something completely different. It would mean maybe your state does not prevent you from seeing content from other countries, or maybe it does not uh, allow you to um, buy the equipment or services that you want on the internet. So sovereignty, as the Chinese interpret it, means bordering the internet. There's just no way around that. And I, I just, whether you're in favor of that or not is not what I care about. Let's just have a clear dialogue and not confuse individual digital self-determination with a state sovereignty based approach. Get the word sovereignty out of your vocabulary if you wanna talk about digital self-determination because it's completely uh, opposed to, to state sovereignty. Thank you very much for the clarification, Professor Milton Miller, and also uh, for the opportunity to have this ex exchange between the NIR's perspective and the workshops and the sessions organized during the IGF. I think this is uh, one of the goals for the IGF to bring us together precisely to share uh, those views and uh, to have this opportunity to exchange and really build something going forward. So the remark to keep this difference um, that was made a, um, a little bit earlier too is, is very important in terms of uh, distingu uh, distinguishing uh, digital sovereignty and self-determination. Some of the, 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 the speakers made this distinction, but I think it's important to, to highlight that. Um, and I, I go next uh, to my dear friend, uh, Mary, Mary Uduma. Thank you very much for giving me the floor again. And I like what Professor Milton has said to us. He clarified it better because I was going to raise the issue of uh, empowering the user when you come to uh, digital sovereignty and uh, how the intermediaries are empowering the user to be able to manage and take control of your data and not make your data vulnerable or use it for other purposes. And in Nigeria, we have what we call NDPR, which is equivalent to or similar with uh, the um, uh, GDPR. And so and, uh, there are structures that are in place and there are penalties already for violation of um, individual um, uh, uh, data privacy. And so um, I like the clarification because uh, the, the, the issue is that how can I um, have control over my data and not um, exposing myself uh, to, to, you know, unwanted or, 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 or taking my data to where I didn't want it to go to. So that's some of the things we want to do uh, or we are doing in Nigeria because the NDPR specified how individuals can take care of their data and uh, when it violated what, what should be done. And uh, there are structures on how to um, build capacities of uh, data users to know that you know your right, that this is your right to use your data. This is your right to give out your data. Uh, and uh, some are getting, but, but we have not gotten there. We're just still building capacity, capacity. So capacity building also is a key thing to be looked at when we come to uh, personal data or empowerment of individual um, on use of data. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And I see Ponsolet has also the hands up. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Professor Milton. I think, um, what you just said and Mary's contribution is very key because a lot of people look at digital 
sovereignty to want to be as if it's like a state with border and then digital, you know, so it's very good the way you put it. But we have to understand that I think the, the Europeans, I'll give them credit for setting up the GDPR. And to me, the beginning of digital sovereignty starts with this general data protection regulation, you know, you being able to determine what to do with your data. A good example is the right to be forgotten, you know, and I think as much as um, possible, we should try to um, promote in all, all aspects of the globe, the um, GDPR, the European Union standards of the GDPR. I know in Africa, we have the Malabu Convention, which a lot of states, um, because of lack of understanding or lack of um, the will to um, endorse it and to rectify it, I think we have less than 10 countries that have done that. But when you when you when we are to, when we are talking of, of this digital sovereignty, I think everything relates to the EU GDPR. Because today, when I look at my European colleagues, whether whether it's old folks of my age or younger folks, they all know what it means being online and what it means for. Um, data protection to them. And I think when we look at digital sovereignty from that aspect, it will ease the fears, fears of states that want to put the internet in a box, you know, because once we don't define it well in, in, in the layman terms, as Professor um, Milton um, just did, um, we're in for a long ride. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Poncelet. And um, I think we came to a point where we have uh, perhaps uh, two trends that are very interesting. One is an example where, uh, well, regulatory approaches at the local level, and then we are talking about sovereignty in the sense of the ultimate power of uh, ruling um, that is uh, positive, which is the data protection one. So it's the ultimate goal of uh, uh, empowering the user um, and uh, and uh, how well capacities are also needs to be built and foster within the policies, but uh, uh, we come with a more positive. And then we had the question also from Dhaka, Bangladesh and some of the, the previous speakers who were bringing uh, the threats for um, uh, or, or the potential risks uh, for this uh, regulatory approach at the local level that could uh, um, have an impact to the, the infrastructure. So there is um, uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, I'm avoiding the, the good and the bad in terms of the moral sense, but there is this balance that needs to be taken into account um, that I think uh, we can, uh, I have Pedro, Pedro, you want to, to, to make a comment on that, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add something uh, to what Professor Milton has said and complementing what others have already added to the discussion is that another kind of co uh, confusion, confusion that we must be careful to not fall into is that between uh, cultural differences and governmental desires because too many times uh, governmental desires or uh, governmental objectives aims are presented as cultural differences. And this is presented more of a self-determination way, a self-determination uh, advancement when it's in fact uh, a, a digital sovereignty uh, movement, a digital sovereignty uh, act in the concepts that were presented to us by Professor Milton. And, this is something that can be uh, really stressful when we are talking about because you can't get, you can uh, offend uh, this part about cultural differences. But if it's something that a government, a government is imposing uh, through their own will, through their own desire, and it's bad for the population, you can't just talk about cultural differences. The example that I'm thinking of is the attempt, the ongoing attempt to regulate uh, content moderation there in Brazil, that the justification is about giving uh, freedom of expression and self-determination to Brazilians in relation to social media. But it's actually something that there was a, a su survey around the population. It's something that uh, the population, uh, Brazilian population simply doesn't want. 
but when you see the government trying to well, pass this bill or uh, through another means, uh, the provisional measure, for example, it's always based on something that we as a uh, country, as a people, cannot just let uh, orders from the outside uh, say what we can't, we can't say and what we can't say. So something very important to keep in mind. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. And I think you make an important point also uh, on where we're talking about sovereignty and what we are talking about the so-called sovereignty. And it might be a tweak of uh, more of uh, uh, demagogy uh, <laughs> speaking, but uh, thank you very much. And I have uh, uh, online uh, in the queue, Ikichin, you, you would like to come back? Yeah, uh, thank you. Just some comment, because we, we, as academia, you know, we have some sections uh, on day zero and it's a gigalit conference symposium. So I would encourage some people who are interested in academic perspective to join us next year. It's on day zero. So sovereignty is a big issue, you know, which has been studied uh, academically uh, from different uh, uh, authors from both Europe, Europe and China or Latin America. So basically uh, the, the, the data sovereignty have a two aspect. One is we call the weak sovereignty and the, the other one is called a strong sovereignty, data sovereignty. So when we talk of weak uh, sovereignty, we talk about so like an uh, uh, initiative um, led by the company is more like a personal protection of data privacy, you know. So this is um, about uh, how do we protect individual rights, uh, data rights. Uh, this is a kind of the uh, data sovereignty as well. For example, how do you protect your own data? Or how do you protect uh, you have more autonomy uh, in using the digital tools? So this is, a, uh, just we mentioned, it's a weak, weaker theory of data sovereignty. And then we have a strong theory of data sovereignty, which means it's state-led uh, strategies. For example, like uh, something concerned national security, like data security, you know, for example, if data, which is uh, very sensitive data re related to some uh, secrecy. Uh, so how we handle those data. So this is a kind of other perspective about uh, data sovereignty as well. So we call this a strong sovereignty, like national security, even at the EU level, you know, they also have this concern, for example, for economical concern. That's why they have a, uh, this, uh, X crowd project, which want to maintain the uh, uh, autonomy of the uh, technology and uh, as well the economical development. So this is what we call a strong sovereignty. So we will have to be more nuances about uh, how do we uh, categorize, define and, and understanding the sovereignty to some extent. And the other, uh, so this is the first point I would like to make. And the second point about uh, sovereignty actually is also about uh, uh, policy level, the, the, the public policy level and the infrastructure level. For example, when we talk about uh, uh, infrastructure like IPv6 or critical infrastructure like IPv6 uh, DNAs, the domain name system. And, and I think that's a general agreement. Those things is belong to the public, global public good, which means it's not a suggest uh, subject to, to one nation to control it. So there's no one nation can control the domain system is, is subject to the management by the ICON, you know. And uh, of course, people argue ICON is also American uh, based on uh, American subject to the American jurisdiction. But uh, up to now, we haven't uh, seen any uh, bad, uh, I mean, uh, bad uh, case uh, related to the independence of ICON so far. So, so this is, uh, so we, we, we can see the infrastructure level, we have some core, you know, we call the public core, the core of the public infrastructure, which is not subject to the national sovereignty. But on the other hand, uh, in terms of public policy level, for example, if, if the, in terms of content regulations or antitrust regulation, or even over the resource, uh, resource regulation. So national uh, country or national government has a, uh, jurisdiction over it. So that is what uh, they talk about. Uh, national sovereignty is on that respect, uh, aspect. So the, 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 the sovereignty has an international public good aspect as well as the public policy aspect. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your cl clarifications, Ike, and uh, also for raising uh, the discussions with another uh, session, uh, the, the GigaNet uh, that, that happened uh, the, the, the day zero. zero. Yeah, and uh, just uh, as a parenthesis, GigaNet is the one that brought me to the first IGF in 2007 to present the paper on internet yeah. governance and the sovereignty principle. So yeah, <laughs> I think too. this is still an issue. <laughs> and I still don't have the answers. So, uh, but let's, uh, I'm going for the last, uh, um, uh, the last intervention that I have in the queue, and then I'm going to wrap it up. We have uh, only 10 minutes, and I want to give the speakers a chance to react uh, to everything we've been hearing. And, and so let me call uh, Kiwaku Antiwi. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing this so badly. <laughs> that, that's fine. His name is Kweku Entry from Ghana. And thanks for the opportunity for this um, intervention and topic. I think um, one thing that when we're talking about data sovereignty and the essence of data policy, we tend to miss out one of the repositories of data. That is like for Ghana, for example, where I'm speaking from, we have what we call the statistical service and they are the repository of government data and any kind of data. And I like the intervention from GigaNet and the academia. Um, I tend to wear different hats and tend to pick up from that in terms of data itself. And I think um, in collaborating and in moving these conversations forward, we need to be able to have that collaborative research approach and in terms of the essence of people also contributing data. Because what we tend to find a lot is that um, the absence of data and also persons being able to share their data for it to be utilized in a manner in which it's use useful for all of us to benefit from becomes a problem. So I just like to raise a point and thanks for the opportunity as we collaborate forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kiakuo. Um, and uh, let me then wrap it up uh, by asking our speakers uh, who shared in the, the beginning the pitches from their respective local initiatives. Uh, what do we do next? What is going, uh, what we can do and what is the call for action uh, to action that you would uh, recommend after hearing uh, so many views? There are certainly synergies uh, among the, 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 the regions and the, the initiatives and there are also um different uh diverse views so what would you propose going forward uh i'm going to start with pedro please go ahead well this of course isn't uh, an easy answer but i would uh, just come back to what i said before when we're talking about uh, digital sovereignty uh, and self-determination as a side Part. It's, I think, believe the most important thing right now is uh, being able to make a, uh, to differentiate what is uh, state-oriented uh, policy and what is actual self-determination, what is something that uh, a way to see the internet that doesn't just reply the way that U.S. values and in a somewhat manner uh, European values are hard, hardwired into the way we see the internet right now, the internet governance ecosystem. So being able to make this difference is and create regulation by making policy, public policies upon that is probably the most important part of this, this discussion right now. Thank you very much, Pedro. And next I have Aileen. Would you like to say what's next? Thank you very much, Raquel, for giving me the floor. I will try to, very, to be very brief because my connection is, isn't great today. Um, so about the way forward, um, I think about, um, well, different investments uh, from countries. Uh, I can tell about a little bit about the example of the Argentina government um, who received a loan from the World Bank and this uh, loan was key for the implementation of the modernization and innovation project of public services. And this loan allowed the implementation of government digital services across Argentina, the development of digital platforms, and the usage 
of data to foster the innovation of the provision of public services. Um, and over this loan of $80 million uh, is focused mainly on the universalization of access uh, to ICTs, the opening of 200 digital points, uh, puntos digitales in Spanish, and the ampliation of the National Center of Data of ARSAT, um, A-R-S-A-T, um, and also, as I was saying previously, if um, this uh, loan can also um, be dedicated to increase all the infrastructure, it could definitely help uh, to improve the digital sovereignty of Argentina. And as youth, we believe these type of measures are essential to bring in more inclusive internal governance for our country. Thank you very much. Gracias and obrigado. Gracias, Eileen, and thank you very much for your remarks. And also, um, I know it's very early in Argentina right now, so thank you very much for joining us in certain uh, conditions. And then uh, next, I have uh, Poncelet, if you want to tell us the way forward. Um, to me, um, the main thing in the way forward, we should make it have a human rights-centric approach when we are looking at digital sovereignty, because once we look at it from that dimension and you look at the right for people to be able to express themselves however they feel, and we link it up to um, the digital um, cooperation roadmap in terms of digital inclusion, especially for the most vulnerable, I think um, we'll be having a good discussion because a lot, a, a lot of things, when I look at digital sovereignty, people also fail to understand the need for it to have that human rights approach in doing things, that compassion, that need that there are people still there that are millions that are still digitally excluded. And we cannot be talking about these subjects um, for people staying in big cities, forgetting that we have millions that have not even been able to see the benefits of the internet to their day-to-day -day, day -day lives. We have all seen what has happened during this pandemic. There are countries whereby children have not gone to school for a long time. Yesterday, we were having a session in the morning during the preliminary. My um, colleague from Uganda and friends, Sarah Kidin, was saying how long um, Uganda kids have been out of school. And that shouldn't be happening in the world we have today. You know, and um, I think when those things with a human um, rights centric approach, we'll be able to address them. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Poncele. And uh, our final remarks from uh, Peter. Peter, can you take the floor? What's next? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, well, that th there's an easy then there's an easy response to that, and that is definitely um, continuing the discussion, but at the same time um, making it a bit more informed in a way that <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I appreciate all the remarks about confusing uh, confusion of language and so on and so forth. And I agree with these distinctions suggested. But on the other hand, this confusion is reflective of what is happening within the local or national communities and within politics and so on and so forth. So um, uh, what, what is on us, I think, um, collectively and individually in, in the various NRIs to actually take, take up this confusion and try to dissect it a bit and address um, all of these important topics, um, make sure that we understand and we make other people understand where they are connected. Because of course, there is a connection between the self-determination of an individual and the sovereignty of the state as Milton and others have, have suggested. But it probably doesn't make sense to um, now at, at a progressing state of discussion um, to discuss this all um, all together. So we have uh, the, the state sovereignty aspects. We have this interesting question of whether there are, whether or not there are boundaries on the internet, um, whether or not the 
focusing on data locality is important or what data access regimes might, might uh, how, how they might come into play. And um, this, this whole uh, surveillance aspect that was touched upon or the, the uh, aspect that I think came from Bangladesh where um, someone said that yes, states are imposing data protection, but in the end it is somehow about content regulation. That's also an interesting connection. That's something, um, and maybe quote, quote, being easy, we, we, we should go back to, to anybody who's proposing uh, a session about data sovereignty and make sure they explain what they exactly mean. Um, and uh, so can, can steer the discussion a bit. That's at least what, what we are trying to do back home um, to, to make sure that we, uh, have a uh, continued and improved discussion by, by improving the focus maybe. But I think this was a very helpful um, information exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And also thank you for making my job easier. You gave such a good uh, rep that I can't do any better. Um, I just wanna tell you that uh, the Polish hosts made it very difficult for you. It's a very competitive process. Now, uh, IGF 2021 is <laughs> as good <laughs> as uh, Berlin one. So uh, I, I just want to say thank you very much for everyone here uh, on site and online uh, for this very interesting discussions. Uh, I think we are going to have much more into the NRS uh, collaboration list. And then uh, Anya, uh, uh, our dear focal point is going to take over. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy. Bye. <laughs>